My name is Robert Michael Polich, Sr. I was born June 7, 1921 in Crosby, Minnesota. When World War II started, we were poor. We, we were poor. We weren't hungry because we raised our food, but we were poor. So when the service came, God, you know, it was employment. We would be fed, we'd be clothed, and uh, God, we were gung-ho. I never had another girlfriend. I courted her from when she was in 10th grade until we got married, and we were married for 60 years. Uh, her parents disliked me intensely because I wasn't Catholic, but I loved my wife, and we got married. And uh, went on a honeymoon for two weeks, came back, and off I went to Fort Snelling. I was made first pilot on a B-17 when I got my commission and got my orders to go overseas. When I got to Chalveston, uh, my crew was there. We got together. They didn't like me. I was too strict. But we got together, and we had a one. We became lead crew. The toughest, Berlin, three times. Some of them, a lot of them were real rough. I think it was my fifth mission. I wasn't quite sure what happened. All I knew was I had wounded men aboard. They hauled out the ambulance, and there was a, a young body on the stretcher. And I knelt beside him. Hmm. Huh. He was covered with blood. And I knelt beside him and lifted his head, and I was holding him in my arm, and he looked up at me, and he says, Mama, and he died. And that got me. I'll never forget that, you know. The final mission, we uh, had a hell of a time. We were under attack most of the time, a lot of flack. And we turned on the IP and I got a radio message over, uh, uh, Red Leader, you are on fire. And I looked and I saw this great big ball of flame about 20 feet back of me. Well, what do I do? So I said, I'm gonna drop these goddamn bombs. So I kept them with the target and we dropped their bombs. I was at 26,000 feet and I put the ship in a steep dive. I couldn't blow a fire up. So I gave the command bail up. Unfortunately, I, it was very uncomfortable for my parachute, these straps that came up here, and I was unbuckled them and let them hang. So immediately when I knew I was gonna bail out, I just picked up those things and snapped them on and they were real loose. I bailed out, I went back, the airplane was above me, and uh, I didn't wanna be underneath that aircraft when it was burning, so I pulled the ripcord to get away. It split, naturally, it just it split me down here. Well, anyway, when I hit the ground, I couldn't absorb the shock because my legs were... When I hit it, I um, busted my back all to hell. <laughs> and I just laid there, and my head was on the side like this. And I saw a pair of wooden sandals. And my mind was just, geez, did I make Holland? Then that goddamn sandal would <laughs> start to connect with my ribs. The next thing I remembered, I was in a jail in Frankfurt. And about Christmas time, I was able to get up and walk around, and uh, I was shipped to Stalag Luft Three. It was a, a big area with these long barracks and a big appel ground where you could they allow us to walk around. And we had an open uh, latrine with just ditches. Smell was terrible. Food was terrible. We were supposed to get a package from the International Red Cross. There was supposed to be one package per man per week. We got one package for 12 men for a month. Yet, there were so many humorous things that happened. The head commandant of the camp came in with a bicycle and he went to the general's billet and he parked his bicycle out in front of the door and he went to talk to the general. He came out and the bicycle was gone. I don't know, the Americans took that bicycle and never saw it. They never found the parts. <laughs> Pilot 
Popeye was an elderly man. His job was to discover tunnels. Well, at that late in the game, we weren't building many tunnels. But anyway, he would go around and we got friends with him. And he could speak a little English, American. So we talked to Popeye and we found out that if he found a tunnel, he would get two weeks leave. So we told Popeye, we're going to build a tunnel for you. And we went and scratched a little underneath the barracks, you know, just moved some dirt. And we'd look up and said, not yet, you know. And we'd scrape no more dirt, not, not yet, you know. And we'd, maybe we had about three feet. He says, okay, Papa. And he came running up, poked his screwdriver down, and, ha, ha, tung, ha, tung. Well, he got his two weeks vacation. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. He had bad days and good days, more good days than bad. Let's put it that way. We knew the war was getting pretty close. And we could hear this rumbling in the distance. And boom, 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 boom. All hell broke loose. We all hit the dirt on our face. We were lying there and then we saw these Sherman tanks breaking down the barricades, you know, just coming in there. And there was sergeant on top throwing cigarettes to us and you know, well, it was over for us. And then uh, Patton comes in and he was standing up there with all this glitter, shiny helmet. He's standing in the back of the Jeep and hell, you think he was going to parade with all his fancy, he didn't have combat uniform on. He had a great big chest. He was real big. You know. And then when he opened his mouth, and he used some pretty vulgar language, you'd swear it was a woman. You'd swear it was a woman talking and shouting. And just, and that's the kind of voice he had. I was a hero when I came back to Arton, the Crosby Arton, and they threw a big banquet for me. The first prisoner war, the first one that got the Purple Heart, and all that crap. So the mayor got up, you know, and everybody clapped and all that. Says, well, Mr. Polish, what would you like to do? Hell, I, I, I didn't have any business. I didn't, I didn't go to college. I did nothing. I was a miner. I worked in the mine. I said, I'd like to have a liquor store. It was complete silence. He said, well, there's no liquor license available. I said, yes, there is. He said, what do you mean? I said, my stepfather told me there's a dormant liquor, liquor license in Ireland. Checked around, sure enough. There was a liquor license, so they gave it to me. I bought 500 feet of lake shore for $12,000, <laughs> buildings and everything. Decided I'd build a supper club. One night, uh, the place was jammed on a Saturday night. Here comes this man and woman sitting at the bar, and God, the place was jammed. I said, you want to sell this place? I said, yeah, everything I got is for sale. I was 62 years old. He says, what do you want for it? This is a gospel truth. I just reached up and I pulled the number down. I'm like, ah! He didn't blink an eyelash. Took out his checkbook, wrote out a check for, hold it, he says, I'll buy it. And suddenly I was wealthy. I was watching TV. And I'm up there 20 some thousand feet and dropping bombs, killing people. That was my job. And this damn TV showed the results of some of the raids that I was on. And it showed women and little children that died because I went over the edge. I had to go to a psychiatrist. I just, my wife said, I wake up screaming. You know, I killed little children. Sometime the men you serve in combat with will be as close or closer to you than your own family. I think that's true. I still can close my eyes and see my, some of my fellows that I served in the service with. Of course, most of World War II people are gone now and it diminishes by several thousand a month or something. Would I have exchanged that period of my life? No. It's, uh, it's something that will stay with me all for the rest of my days. Would I do it again? No.